Well, hey folks, welcome to our March 22 meeting. Um, I forgot to record this kind of early section announcements during the actual meeting, so that's why I'm doing it. It'll be a little bit disjointed going into Oliver's presentation, but <clears throat> so welcome to our um, last meeting of the season. And um, Oliver Ankens is talking about Alaska steelhead fishing tips and tricks today. So if you're not familiar with the club, the Midnight Sun Flycasters was established in 1976. And the goals of the club are to kind of build a fly fishing community in interior Alaska, um, share knowledge and skills. And um, we always host really cool events like our monthly meetings in the winter where people like Oliver uh, would bring in great folks to talk about um, their fishing adventures and, and also to teach um, skills and that sort of thing. We also um, do different things like uh, we've got adopted a section of the Chino Hot Springs Road for litter pickup. So we go out there a couple times a year and do that. So there's periodic um, casting clinics, fly tying nights, and then also the, the club puts on the kids camp every summer where kids from age 10 to 16 go and learn all aspects of, of fly fishing. Um, so if you're if you want to know more information, check out our social media handles there and our website. <clears throat> a few announcements before I hand things off to Oliver. So like I said, this is our last meeting of the season. We won't have an April meeting. Last year we did, but this year instead we're going to do, a, we're going to co-host a screening of the International Fly Fishing Film Festival at the UAF Pub. That's going to be uh, in collaboration with uh, Trout Unlimited, which Oliver is the president of the local chapter, and also Backcountry Hunters and Anglers. That'll be Sunday, April 24th at 6.30 p.m., the tickets will be real cheap. We've set them at like 10 bucks in advance, 15 at the door, so that, um, you know, it won't be a big big lift for people to to be able to participate in that. So that should be really fun. We've got some good prizes lined up. And, uh, and yeah, I hope to see you guys there. Uh, if you didn't hear, the, our kids' camp is moving forward from June 10th to 12th at Lost Lake Boy Scout Camp. The registration's open, and uh, six people have signed up. There's still 14 spaces, spaces remaining. So get the word out there if you know anybody who might be interested. We're still looking for volunteers for the camp, especially for helping uh, with the kitchen, which is a fair bit of work uh, because the meals for the campers are are cooked on site there and, and whatnot. So that, that's um, we're looking for somebody that would be willing to work in, uh, with the kitchen stuff. And then any sort of general uh, volunteer help is, uh, is definitely welcome. So send me an email or, or contact us if you might be interested in that. Uh, we still have our online membership option. If you haven't renewed your dues yet for this year, or you want to give somebody a gift of a membership or or, um, or you want to sign somebody up for kids camp, you can do all that on our online shop on our website there. Um, and you can also access that through our Facebook page if you don't want to try to write down that long URL. Uh, some other events we have coming up. So we'll probably do our Chena Hot Springs Adopt a Highway Cleanup probably in uh, kind of late May with the big snow year this year. I'm thinking, uh, you know, it'll be later in May when all the snow is off up there and we can go out and, and do our cleanup. And that's like mile 45 or so. It's near uh, some fish and game stock ponds. And it's also along the the, Chena, the upper Chena River. So it's a fun day to go out. Um, last year, Will and I also did a float after the, the pickup. And then we uh, cut out some, you know, debris and, and um, hanging trees and stuff along that section of the river. It's called kind of another additional community service. So we'll probably do that again this year. Um, we may do a casting clinic. I need to check with Fred DeSico. He often has put on like a spring casting clinic, which is always good because we're coming out of winter, not having a lot of practice. So it's good to, uh, you know, kind of get the fly rod out and, and do some casting practice at a nice setting. Usually that's at the, the pump house lawn, which is a good place to do it. So that's about it for announcements. Um, so I'll just introduce today's presenter, Oliver. And like I said, this he the meeting was recorded yesterday, but I'm just going through this um, this introduction because I forgot to record the introduction. But Oliver is a very accomplished fly fisherman and writer. He's written a bunch of pieces for um, outlets like Fly Lords, one awesome one about his one of his trips up north um, after Dolly Varden. And uh, he grew up, I believe, in over in, in Michigan. And he's been fly fishing since a very young age. He's very passionate about steelhead fishing. And um, he's always catching really large fish through the ice and also in open water. He kind of specializes with uh, lake trout and steelhead and so i'm really excited to have him talking today about a bunch of tips and uh, tricks for steelhead fishing in alaska uh, i've got a trip coming up next month or two months from now so 
it'll be useful for me um, to pick up some stuff as well. So with that, I'll hand it over to Oliver. All right. Hope everyone can hear me. Um, so before I get cut off, I was just thanking Kevin um, for um, everything he's been doing over here at uh, Midnight Sun Flycasters. Um, I get a lot of people asking me if they know him and and uh, happy to say that I do. So um, thanks again, Kevin. Um, and then uh, I know everyone, I know the local fishing community really, really appreciates it as well. So a um, little more about me. Um, so I started uh, fly fishing um, when I was three. Um, and then I kind of um, took a break for quite some time and uh, on and off every year. Um, and then I kind of really got into, I grew up in Michigan and I really got into um, steelhead fishing out there with conventional gear and uh, and then still some some fly um, fly fishing, but it was mostly center pinning and, and spin, spin fishing and then um, uh, bait casting as well. So I'll touch on that stuff a little bit, but um, I know that this is a fly fishing um, club, so we'll keep it keep it within the fly fishing realm. Uh, so. And the overview. Um, so we're going to touch on some seasons uh, around the seasons when um, when you can fish for steelhead and when they're available in the rivers. Um, we don't have any summer on fish up here. Um, you know, you kind of hear odds, you know, every people will pick them up every once in a while in July, but they're very few and far between during the summer months. Um, and we'll touch on some gear um, and then nymphing beating and then um, swinging and then some other tactics um, as well. So I don't have a ton of slides, so I'm going to spend a lot of time on uh, on a lot of these slides. Um, <clears throat> so steelhead fishing seasons um, in the fall, and that's the fall is kind of my favorite time to actually target steelhead. Um, you get a lot of a lot of bright fish coming in in the fall, and um, they tend to, to fight a little bit harder, um, and uh, they are um, seem to be a little bit um, more grabby. You know, they're fresh. A lot of them are fresh in from the salt. Um, and you can, and, uh, and they'll, they're pretty willing to take, take a swung fly, um, when you can find them, um, winter fishing for steelhead, um, you know, the Casillo off and in the Kenai or some rivers, another long drive, but, um, it can be done and it's, but it's, it's a long drive and it's, you know, usually end up being skunked, um, you know, most of the time, but every once in a while you find a, find a few fish in the winter up here in Alaska and, uh, and then um, you can hopefully catch them. And then the spring, um, a lot of a lot of guys spend a lot of time in the spring fishing for steelhead um, down in like the southeast, um, down on the Sea Tuck. Um, and uh, I uh, I have a hard time fishing for steelhead in the spring. Um, there's usually some other stuff that I like to chase, but um, I do love going down to the southeast and um, and and getting on a few of a few of those fish. Um, I think fall is my favorite time of year um, for targeting steelhead. Um, so like I said earlier, gear, um, we'll touch on some conventional center pin and then um, some fly fishing gear. Um, <clears throat> so as far as uh, conventional gear goes, um, what you're kind of looking for um, in a spinning rod or bait cast is you're looking for a rod between about eight to 10 feet. Um, long and that's a medium to uh, a light spinning rod. Um, and when you're fighting a fish on, it's similar to a flyer when you're fighting a bigger fish on a longer rod. Um, it allows for a little more, um, uh, you have a little more margin for error. Um, <clears throat> uh, with a center pin and, or a float rod, um, and then and with a bait caster and a spinning rod, I'm primarily doing uh, most of my fishing. Um, with floats. Um, we do throw, um, you know, we'll throw spoons and spinners um, <clears throat> and then we'll even crankbaits and we'll call it swinging or sweeping crankbaits, but it's basically just swinging, um, swinging a crankbait with a conventional rod. Um, so you're kind of swinging that, swinging that uh, crankbait up under logs and, and um, through holes and that um, actually works really well. Um, and then center pinning, um, it's uh, it's basically designed for float fishing. Um, it's a free spooling float uh, float reel. Um, so it's just a pin in the center of a spool, 
uh, essentially, and and it's there's no drag on it, so you can drift, um, basically achieve a drag-free drift um, for as long as you want but until you run out of line. Um, the size of the rod you're looking at for that is nine to twelve feet, medium like a medium light to ultra light rod. Um, if I had pictures of them, you know, I'd show them, but um, I don't. I don't really do that stuff too much anymore. It's primarily all um, all fly fishing and swinging um, swinging flies at that. So this was taken down uh, in uh, in September. Um, down, we were trying to pick up some some early fish, um, but that, that's down in the in the Kenai Peninsula. Oh, all right. So, uh, fly fishing tactics, um, nymphing, and then beating can fall under nymphing as well. Um, <clears throat> so. Nymphing, it's going to be your kind of your standard nymph setup. You're going to run like a nine to, you know, nine foot leader or longer. Um, personally, I don't run a tapered leader um, when I'm nymphing or beading. If I nymph or bead, I don't do it too much, um, but I'll just run like, uh, um, just run your indicator right up against your fly line. And that makes it a little bit easier um, to cast. And then it kind of handles a, like depth change um on the river bottom and, and through the river um a little bit better than setting that indicator down farther um down farther on your leader um so standard nymph rig though it's going to be um your fly line to your or full floating fly line to your um <clears throat> to your indicator or to your leader and then your indicator um then a split shot or a couple split shots depending on on the river you're fishing, if the current's pretty fast, you're going to run a couple of split shots um, and then about 18 inches to a pegged bead or um, or a stone flying in for whatever nymph uh, you choose um, and then swinging. Um, <clears throat> jump into that in a little while. So um, nymphing, these are some stone flies that I tied um, for someone. Um, personally, I don't do a lot of um, Nymphing for steelhead um, or beating. Um, I, I tend to fish. I tend to fish um, so I swung fly for steelhead, and that's pretty much that's pretty much my um, my realm uh, for steelhead fishing nowadays. Um, and even at that, I um, fishing for steelhead. I kind of have. Um, I really try to limit like how many I'm actually catching per day, um, and really try to pay um, pay close attention to. Um, where like if I can control hook placement and all and it seems like when you swing a fly to those fish the hook ends up in a, in a more favorable spot to the fish as opposed to um, running a bead or you know a small nymph where they might suck it down and uh, it might cause damage to that fish but um, <clears throat> I always clip the barbs on all of my hooks regardless of what I'm fishing and then I'll downsize hooks um, as well to preserve those fish because they are um, I'm sure as, as a lot of people know and are aware, you know, they are struggling kind of throughout uh, like the Pacific Northwest, they can be. And, and then they're even closing down like the Olymp uh, uh, Olympic Peninsula this year for steelhead, um, for the steelhead season. Um, so I, I do try to really practice conservation with a lot of the steelhead fishing and really make sure that we're, um, that I'm, um, uh, Fishing is, you know, I mean, fishing is not necessarily ethical, but um, if you're just catch and releasing fish, but um, try to practice ethical, ethical fishing and and not uh, not just kind of beat them over the head, you know, constantly. So um, one or two a day, and then I'm and I'm kind of done done with my day, and I just will take uh, either just start skating flies for them um, or um, make sure I'm changing flies regularly. So um, as far as swinging goes, and this is like I said, kind of my realm of, um, of what I, how I like to, how I prefer to fish for steelhead. Um, there are a lot of different ways, but these are some smaller leeches um, that I tied last winter. Um, unfortunately, um, I had to deploy, so I didn't really get to use them too much yet, but um, 
this spring. Hopefully we'll get out and uh, get after some fish. So um, uh, when you're swinging, um, <clears throat> so you can swing with a single hand fly rod or, um, or a two hander. Um, I prefer to swing um, like a single hand gadget set up on a 10 foot seven weight. That's kind of my go-to um, rod set up for some smaller water steelhead. Um, <clears throat> so I prefer a 10 foot seven weight. It, they, it still works if you choose to fish a uh, single hand gadget set up on a single hand rod. Um, a nine foot rod will work great for that as well. A um, little bit faster action rod tends to, for me, it works a little better. You can cast a little bit faster in tighter quarters. You don't have to create quite such a bait or such a large D loop um, to get your skagit line to, to go forward. Um, as far as two hand rods go, um, <clears throat> you're kind of looking at the 10 and a half to 11 and a half foot range. Um, you'll start switching light, like, you'll start, um, that'll kind of be a switch rod range. Um, and what a switch rod is, is it's a, it's a two hand rod. And theoretically, you can cast it with one hand, but it's if you've ever tried it, it's pretty uncomfortable. Um, so, um, and then from there, kind of moving up into the 12 to 14 foot range, you're looking at um, what some people, I guess, would refer to as a uh, full spay rod. But you know, it's all they're all kind of two hand rods. There wasn't really ever. Um, the best of my understanding is there wasn't really ever supposed to be any distinction between a switch and a spay rod. They're, they, they fall in like this two hand rod class. Um, <clears throat> but um, so rod weights, um, you're kind of looking between like a six and the nine weight, depending on where you're fishing. And, and that's for every species. You know, you want to choose a rod weight that's going to be um, applicable to the fish, the size class of the fish that you're targeting. Um, so a six weight, you're definitely on the light side. Um, <clears throat> if you're if you're kind of in an area where there are a lot of smaller fish, a six weight can be a lot of fun. And even if you do jump up to like a 10 foot six weight, it'll handle those fish a little bit better. It's almost like fishing like a, um, like a center pin rod. It's just a kind of this super long ultra light whip. Um, and it does handle those head shakes well. And then it just comes down to um, how good you are at landing fish quickly and not overworking those fish um, so they get exhausted. Um, I stick between um, like an eight and a seven, like a seven and an eight weight. Um, like I said, a 10 foot seven is just the go-to. I always have that rod with me, um, but <clears throat> um, I'll, bring a I'll bring a switch rod as well for some bigger water and then on very, there's, you know, only a handful of rivers up here where a full size spay is really, um, really, really applicable. But um, <clears throat> my full, I have a 12 foot six weight and that's kind of my go-to for uh, for my larger spay rod, but uh, six, seven switch and then uh, 10 foot seven weight um, for pretty much everything else. And I always have those three rods with me um, when I'm sealed fishing, at least in my car and ready to go if I break a rod. Um, so, um, so now we're kind of looking at fly selection and um, fly line, um, and then your leaders and your sink tips and everything. Um, <clears throat> fly selection when the warm, when the weather's, or when the water, excuse me, when the water's a little bit warmer, um, you don't have to get your fly quite as deep. Um, those fish are, those fish will come up and grab your fly. Um, and you know, there's videos on YouTube and everything of people skating flies for, for steelhead in the middle of winter. You, I mean, you can like, good luck, but you can do it if you want. Um, it's, it gets difficult, but, um, if you're fishing higher in the water column, you know, that's usually tends to be kind of in the summer. Um, so like a lighter sink tip and then, you know, an unweighted fly and kind of swinging through the top section of or top portion of the water column. As, you, as, the, as the year kind of drags on and you're getting more into the winter months, um, <clears throat> you're going to want to slow your fly way down. And uh, actually, I'm going to backtrack um, right here. So fishing in the summer, uh, there's a thing called uh, leading your fly and following your fly and when you're swinging a fly. So when you're, le you can, in the summer, I, I prefer in the fall, um, I prefer to lead my fly. And what that does is 
you put your rod tip ahead of your fly and that speeds up your swing a little bit. Um, and it kind of turns that, kicks that fly a little bit sideways. And it almost looks like whatever fly you're fishing is trying to get away from these fish. Um, <clears throat> as you kind of move into the to winter, um, and you can kind of attribute this if, if any of you have ever swung for king salmon, um, they like a nice straight swing. So when you want your line to be as straight as possible and that fly is just kind of drag, like swinging along very slowly through the current, nice and straight, um, a nice smooth swing. Um, when it starts to get a little colder, that's kind of what I'm doing um, for, for, for those fish that have slowed, their metabolism has slowed way down in the winter and they're not eating as much, they're not nearly as grabby. So slow, you're, you need to slow your swing down and that's when I'll start throwing a lot of weighted flies, heavier sink tips, big skagit lines. You're slowing that fly way down and getting it as deep as possible down to almost like you want to try to hit those fish in the face, basically, in order to get them to grab it. Um, <clears throat> and then come spring, you're going to have a mix of fish. So you're going to have fish that are, are, that are coming in to spawn. You're going to have fish that are current, that are actively spawning. And obviously, you kind of want to leave those those fish alone if you can. Um, uh, you can just leave those fish alone. <laughs> um, and then um, you're going to end up getting um, you're going to end up um, most likely finding some fish that are um, that are what we what people would call a drop back steelhead. So those are fish that have spawned. Um, <clears throat> and I have a picture coming up, I think, of one. Maybe not. Um, but those fish are spawned out. They're usually pretty slender. And uh, <clears throat> we usually, a lot of guys will pick them up when they're swinging for those spring kings come May and uh, May and June, um, you'll kind of pick up some more drop back fish. Um, they kind of hang out in the tail outs below those kings. Um, you know, if you can, I, I try to leave those fish alone as well because um, they're just trying to get back to the salt water. But um, come the spring, you know, you get those fish that are coming in. And again, they're, they just came, came in out of the salt. They're really aggressive. And um, you can fish, a, fish a, 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 a lighter fly, a lighter sink tip, and you'll pick up fish um, up in the uh, higher parts of the water column. Um, it doesn't ever hurt to fish a heavier fly or a heavier sink tip. I mean, it just kind of depends on what you what you want to do, and if you want to huck a huge, you know, a big skag ahead, a big heavy rig, um, you know, you can. You're you're obviously more than welcome to do that. Those fish are kind of scattered throughout the water column, just migrating up to spawn and and uh, get ready. So when you when you're fishing a heavier sink tip and, and a heavy flies, you're trying to get down deep. Yeah. How how short are you going on your leader to you know, keep it from? So for the leader, when you're fishing a heavy sink tip, and thank you for bringing that up. Um, so that was Dan Hoffman. Um, <clears throat> and he has a book out, um, a couple of books, but um, definitely good read. Recommend them um, about fishing across Alaska. Um, so he asked a good question about uh, the leader length. Um, <clears throat> so the leader length, I tend to run if I'm running. Um, a heavy fly and a heavy sink tip, say uh, a T14 or T17 or something, um, I'm going to shorten my leader down to about 24 inches, um, 20 to 24 inches, um, super short. Um, you know, and as those sink tips get lighter, um, I'm kind of lengthening my leader a little bit. So I'll start running maybe, um, you know, if I'm getting into the T8 to T11 realm, I'm running about 36 inches of uh, fluorocarbon. Um, and I stick with uh, some lighter line. I'll stick with uh, eight, um, eight to ten, to ten pound. Um, and then if I'm running a huge fly, I'll sometimes bump it up to twelve, and and uh, every once in a while fifteen. Um, luckily in Alaska, these fish aren't terribly line shy. I'm sure. I'm sure Alex uh, here is uh, has dealt with some some finicky fish, and they're pretty line shy. So um, that's probably a necessity down in like the Pacific Northwest. Um, and I know it is in, in Michigan, those fish get, whether those are steelhead or not, I'm not gonna go into that, but um, that's a whole different uh, uh, conversation. But um, those fish are, 
I mean, it gets tough. You know, we'll we'll swing with four pound. Um, it's really those fish are really really line shy, and uh, you know, because they're just getting beat on so much. But um, the fish up here, they're not quite as line shy. Um, and Alaska can be kind of forgiving to the steelhead angler. Um, but um, yeah, so um, 20 to 24 inches of uh, fluorocarbon. And then um, as you're starting to fish shallower, um, <clears throat> you're going to run, or I run, um, you know, 30, 24 to 36 inches. If I'm still running a sink tip and then if I'm skating a fly, um, I'll just run um, like 12 pound, um, 12 pound monofilament. So that fly, um, that line, that leader's not dragging that fly under at all. It's floating nice and high. And then I let the material of the fly actually drag as opposed to um, trying to make it, you know, trying to set it down in the water with the leader material. So um, for those of you that um, don't know, fluorocarbon sinks in monofilament um, floats. So um, Yep. So, and then we can even go back a little bit further to nymphing. When I'm nymphing, if I nymph, um, I'll run pure fluorocarbon. So, um, just to, to make sure that 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 line is not uh, not floating at all. So, <clears throat> so the water types of water that you're looking for um, for steelhead. Um, so you're looking for the depth and speed of water. Um, so the depth, I mean, everyone will tell you, you know, knee deep walking speed water is the type of swinging water that you're, that you're looking for. Not everyone, but, you know, a lot of steelhead anglers will tell you um, knee deep and walking speed. Um, and that is, yeah, it's a great place to start. It really is. Um, I find a lot of steelhead um kind of in the heads and tail outs of runs, um, as opposed to those big long stretches that look so so juicy for steel or for swinging a fly. And, and um, I tend to focus a lot of my efforts on the heads and, and the tail outs of runs, um, not so much in the actual guts of, of the run. Um, and then if you're looking for, um, you know, if you're looking for fish, I guess more in like, uh, those fish that have been in the river for a long time. Um, you can find some pockets um, and those fish that have been in the river for, for a couple weeks or a couple months, they'll kind of hold up in these pockets um, and those fish are just kind of waiting for, um, you know, getting staging and starting to get ready um, for either to overwinter in the lakes or in the river if there's no lake to go to. Um, they're just kind of finding, you know, a good place to rest. Um, so they'll hang out in those pockets. And then um, as with all migrating fish and just fish in general, um, they'll sit in the seams as well. Um, so that's a good place to run, um, run a bead or a, or a nymph through. Um, and then if you're swinging, um, so kind of how I'll swing a pocket or how I'll swing uh, through a seam, especially if it's on the far side of the river. Um, so I'll cast across the river. And then as opposed to, um, I guess, some good verbiage for swinging a fly is the cast swing step um, or motto. Um, so it'll be a cast <clears throat> swing a step. So you'll cast and then swing your fly and then you step, um, step down about, you know, two to three feet. Um, just just take a step and then you kind of work that's how you'll work a run so if i'm fishing is trying to hit a seam or a pocket on the far side of the river i will um, cast step and then swing so i'll cast and then that step in between the swing and the cast will allow that fly some more time to sink and then before i step down i'll mend my line take a huge take a big mend and that'll drop that fly down into that pocket a little bit further. And then if you still don't feel like you're getting down enough, you know, don't be afraid to change your, to change your leader setup, to change your sink tip um, to match whichever, um, whichever uh, run you're fishing or whatever water you're trying to fish. Um, a good takeaway or big takeaway and something that I do regularly is I'll, I'll pull up to a stretch river that I think, you know, I want to fish and I'll just look at it for a while, try to get a feel for how deep it is, 
try to understand what I'm looking at. <clears throat> and then I'll choose my light, my, my sink tip and my, and sometimes even change the head of the fly line um, to that. If it's, you know, if I'm running a full fly line or a full floating uh, Skagit head or a Scandi head or something, um, I will, um, I'll change, I'll change it out for an intermediate or even a full sinking head. And then, um, you know, run your, uh, run my um, uh, sink tip um, accordingly um, to, or uh, based off of the head that I, that I have on. And then, like I said earlier, choose your leader, um, your leader length accordingly and leader material um, accordingly. So a good place to start looking for migrating fish and fish that are moving is that, um, you know, knee deep, walking speed water, it's a good place to start, but don't be afraid um, to fish pockets and, um, and heads and tail outs of runs. A lot of times those fish will come in and they'll park in the tail out and they'll lay there for a while. And on the days where I'm having a hard time finding fish, um, I'll kind of just, you know, I'll work the entire run and I usually end up finding fish. You know, if they're not in the head of the run, they're probably at the tail. So, um, <clears throat> You know, we've had days where we'll, you know, go all day and not touch a fish. And on the last run, my gal throw one in the shin, the shot, you know, just fish all the way through a tail out. And they'll be back down farther than you think that they are. So, I mean, they'll lay up in eight inches of water and, you know, you'll never, you won't be able to see them there because at that point there's other rocks and boulders and everything, but they'll sit way back in a run. And so don't be afraid to to really push through the entire run and work every piece, work every inch of water that you can um, until your fly starts dragging and then change out your leader or change out your sink tip and then keep fishing through it. Um, so, and then, um, yeah, um, I guess that's really all I have um, for, for steelhead fishing um, up here. Um, yeah, if there's any, that's supposed to say questions, but it's just a blank slide. So that's good. Um, yeah, if you have any questions, um, if anyone has any questions, um, you know, email them to, to myself or I'm sure Kevin. Um, yeah, or we can talk about them now too. Got yeah. Time, so. yeah, we do got plenty of time. So I guess I'd, I'd have a question that you could probably answer it actually. Any of you three guys could probably answer it better than me. I'm woefully ignorant when it actually comes to steelhead. I've, uh, tons of trout fishing, tons of grain fishing, but I've done very little steelhead fishing. And so I don't have a real good sense as to like, you know, when you're talking like when you're talking about spawners or like are, are they normally spring spawners or are they are they fall spawners? Does it depend on the drainage? I mean, about the only steelhead fishing I've done up here has been down like a sea lock in the spring. And I, if I remember right, I think that that was like a crooked creek hatchery run where they were coming up here to sea lock to get back into crooked creek. But um but like I say, that's really about the only steelhead fishing I've done. And a lot of the, the fishing down at Katmai, um, I, a lot of those fish, I think, are, are kind of, I don't know if they are steelhead or if they're just like steelhead, but the fact that they're spending most of their time in these big, huge lakes and then just coming up into some of those rivers for pretty short windows before they back down back into the lakes. But as far as spawning activity goes, especially up here in Alaska, what are we dealing with? So in Alaska, we're kind of dealing with um, like April into May. Um, that's kind of when they like to like to spawn. And the, down in the southeast, excuse me, down in the southeast, um, you'll see them um, on the shallow rivers. You can see them up on the gravel beds, and and uh, and then you'll you'll see them making their reds up there. Um, so you'll you'll kind of you know and and. The way to kind of avoid fishing those is, is there's usually bright fish in the holes below those, um, and they're down there, um, usually eating the eggs of, of those other fish or just staging to push up and spawn themselves. So, um, but you'll see them in the spring, um, getting ready to, getting ready to do their, to do their thing. And, uh, um, yeah, so they do tend to spawn in, in the spring. So, but there are ones why, that why? come in in the fall. They spend the entire winter in fresh water. So they come in from the ocean in the fall or sometimes the winter. They'll spend just hang out in a lake or in a river all winter and then they spawn in the spring. So, so yeah, that was my next question. Is that like like the anchor down in the fall? Or so 
well, why are, why are they coming up into there? I mean, if it's is it is it they I'd say is it they choose to hang out in the stream versus the ocean before yeah they spawn in the spring. Or? It's a good question. That I don't think we have a strong answer to as to why that happens. You know, they say that obviously if you're in the ocean, you're going to be growing and eating better than in freshwater. But in the freshwater, you have less predators. Um, Maybe that's not true with all the fishermen that are <laughs> grassing yeah. fish now, but that's kind of how biologists explain it, but it doesn't always match up to our easy explanations like that. It's kind of hard to say why they do that. Yeah, and the why, and in and, and the win in the fall, they'll come in and like they'll overwinter in the big deep holes. And, and uh, you know, that's, but they, they shut those rivers down for that reason, because in the winter, you know, they, there are very specific areas where they will winter over. So that's why they close those rivers um, in, in, uh, in starting in November, you know, all the way through into May to give those fish a break and give them time to, to, uh, to spawn. And so no one's harassing them, you know, in the middle of January when someone when it's negative, you know, negative 30 and people aren't being responsible. On the, the sea tech, they have both the fall and the spring runs. And um, it's interesting, I guess, that some biologists have found that it was actually genetic um, differentiation between the fall and spring run fish. Like they don't, it's not like a fish deciding to either come in in the fall or spring. It's got some something to do with heredity. So, and I've even heard some, some, um, some people talking about. Um, it was on, I listened to a lot of podcasts and some of them fishing related, but there was one and, and um, they were talking about um, on some rivers in the Olympic Peninsula, those fish, um, their summer run seems to just be getting later and later and later um, every year. And, and scientists kind of realized that those aren't actually the summer run fish anymore. They're starting to see just the fall run fish coming in. And those summer run fish have that genetic strain of those fish kind of seem to have dwindled to the point that they're actually having a hard time finding them. So when they, they're getting beat on, so like Kevin was saying that there are genetic different some some you know different strains of fish, and uh, those um, Skimani steelhead are the summer run steelhead, and those fish are um, really hurting. I think maybe with the warming water temperatures and everything, but. Um, yeah, I don't, I'm not a scientist and I try to stay away from too much of that stuff, you know, because I don't know and I don't want to say anything that's not correct. So, yeah. What about fishing out of boats uh, on, on the Sea Tech? I, you know, there's all the, everybody fishes out of drift boats. That's what all the guides use and then kind of the poor people like me are stuck on the bank. But when I do get on the boat, everything's moving so fast. I, don't tend to hook into many fish and I know Alex it's probably your specialty because you're boating all the time for your fishing but I'm yeah. uh, just kind of trying to think of some tips of how I could be more successful out of the boat I end up just stopping at good places and not fishing much out of the boat just because I can never hook anything the fish see the boat they spook you know so I don't know yeah. if you have any tips that might be specific to that sort of fishing uh, well the boat can be used uh, you know, it's just a tool yeah. for uh, approaching the river. So there's many different ways you can do it. A lot of people in the uh, Northwest, there's some rivers I've been on where they swing from the boat, you know, just because you can access the better part of the river that you can't get to from uh, the shore. There's too much foliage or whatever it might be. So uh, just anchoring the boat and swinging one person from the front of the boat is uh, a good way to cover a lot more water. But um, also just drift, you know, 90 degree drift fishing with beads and things like that uh, can be very effective. And uh, also, even like on the Deschutes where you can't fish from the boat, it's just a way to get away from people, access parts of the river that aren't accessible from the road, and um, just cover, see more of the river, cover more water. Yeah, I think it's the main advantage. So on those, so when you're fishing from um guys are swinging from a boat is it just because the water's too deep to or is there like a no like you can't wade in those areas like you're yeah, not allowed to difficult. wade in those areas um you know all all of the above really okay. depending on where you're at and what river you're on okay. um you know a lot of it i even take some people fishing that aren't just physically capable or you know where it's always safety first yeah. so if we feel like the river's not in a uh, safe condition, a little high, or uh, the person is 
physically limited, then we can use that boat as a tool to still get them out there and do some lighting. I mean, there's there's a time where I might put the guy in the back, let him uh, walk the bank mm -hmm. and swing ahead of us and then move somebody down with the boat, you know, behind them or something like that. It, it all depends. It's just another tool to, you know, get more people and more fish to swim, I suppose. Uh, I do a lot of the drift fishing uh, with beads also, and, um, you know, it's very effective and Fun for everybody. <laughs> Even rowing the boat if you're fun. You know, you're working as a team and um, you know, just another tool in the belt kind of thing. And that's one thing I don't have a lot of experience out of is fishing out of a out of a drift boat or of a moving drift boat. But, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's um, you know, like your center pinning, mm -hmm. that thing is deadly on getting a long, yeah. consistent drag free drift. And the boat can be used as a tool to do the same thing, you know, with a shorter cast and uh, like the more traditional fly line, you know, you don't need a lot of specialty equipment. You can get it out there and then the boat follows the drift. Uh, you can also make a very long, deadly drift. Um, and that's just one example of another way, you know, it's a good tool for, uh, for increasing success. And you mentioned skating flies for steelhead. So that's just taking your streamer and you know, swinging it really extremely at the surface of the water, and they'll sometimes come up and hit it. I've never tried that. I mean, I how heard. successful is that? <laughs> Have you found it? Because, uh, like BC, it's famous for yeah. skating flies during a certain type of year. And I would imagine it's a warmer water. Yeah. Yeah. So skating. Um, they're like skating specific flies. Um, and then there's some flies that you can tie. Um, it's called the riffle hitch. And what it is, is it's an overhand knot. Um, so instead of a knot in front of, um, in front of the line, in front of the fly through the eye, it's a, it's a knot that's gonna go, um, you know, tie your, your clinch knot or your loop or, you know, a clinch knot, it works best with a clinch knot. It's kind of pointless to tie a loop knot at that point, but um, you'll tie, then you'll tie an overhand knot. Um, I use a double overhand knot because I don't like overhand knots in the fishing world. That doesn't translate well. It ends up with a broken meter almost every time. So I'll tie it like a, it's basically a double surgeon's knot. Um, and then you actually put it back over the eye onto, um, onto the head of the fly. So onto those onto the thread layer, thread wraps where you've created the head of the fly or, or if you bought your flies or, or whatever you're using, um, it, it goes back over the thread wraps on the fly. So um, <clears throat> and what that does is it kicks your fly sideways and then it brings it up. So those, so that if you're, so um, kind of a classic example for that is like a, like a mother. So like a deer hair mother is, um, you'll get that fly, um, that knot on there and it'll turn that fly like roughly 90 degrees and then it'll raise it up um, into the surface film of the water. Um, other skating, other skate flies, um, I tie mine with foam um, and a lot of rubber legs and they look crazy. They look insane. They're all kinds of crazy colors and stuff. But um, <clears throat> so like purple and black and you know, whatever colors you want. But um, <clears throat> those ones are, you know, you're, you obviously fish them on like a full floating line and then um, monofilament leader. Um, and those flies are you know, made out of foam, so they float really well and they're really, really buoyant. Um, and then you're just kind of skating them through um, through the surface and, and slowing, like speeding up and slowing down your your skate. Um, you know, it's kind of whatever you're feeling, how, how fast the water's moving. Um, it's a very particular instance um, for that. And we do it here um it's not very effective it's really um quite ineffective actually um but um i have a, a good friend of mine um goes down and that's the only way he cares to fish for steelhead is to skate flies and he catches about one a week so <laughs> yep and but that's the only one um, the only way he skates a muddler and he'll catch one per week and that's his fish and he's just over the top happy about it. Cool. He remembers, he said he's over the past 
14 years since he started skating flies. He's caught one per trip. He's caught 14 steelhead on the surface, and that's that's all he cares to do. That's all that's all he likes to do. So he'll go down and spend, you know, two to three weeks on a particular river and go skate flies every day. So do you use a floating tip, or do you just go straight to the uh, fly line, or how do you like to set up? So skate a, so skating a fly is going to be like um, it's just going to be a floating. Uh, if you're doing a two, if you're running a two hand rod or a skagit head, um, then you'll run a float, and I'll run a floating tip off of my skagit head. Um, if I'm when I do skate flies, and I don't do it very often because it's I still like to catch fish. So, um, but more than one a year. More than one per year. I'm getting, I'm getting there. And I, there's a couple of days I've designated a couple of days this year where we're just going to, just going to skate flies. If I catch one, great. If I don't, you know, I knew it was coming. So, but, uh, so I'll run that just on a standard fly line. So on a 10 foot seven, I'll run an eight, an eight weight line and then just a nine foot leader tapered leader. Um, and then I'll, you know, tapering, just taper my own leaders with blood knots and everything. Um, and um, yeah, so that's basically the setup. It's just you know, about as basic as it can get. So fly line, nine foot leader, fly, and cast out. Um, <clears throat> when I'm skating, I'll cast straight across the line or straight across a perpendicular shore, um, as opposed to when you're typically um, swinging a fly, you're going to cast about 45 degrees downstream and then do your big men. And so that fly ends up swinging down. Um, and you can keep your line straight as opposed to having a huge belly in your line. The current won't push your line out into creating this big giant um, belly. And then you're flying up, just ends up just ripping across the current. Um, when I'm skating a fly, I'll kind of do the opposite. And then, and then I'll do a bunch of smaller meds, which actually kind of makes that fly kind of chug along in the, in the surface. And I like to think that it helps. You know, and attract that, something. But is that usually you've spotted some fish and you just kind of <clears throat> repeatedly skate near them, or are uh, you just kind of prospecting sometimes too? A lot of things? times we're not seeing, we're not sight fishing these fish. You know, down in the southeast, a lot of times you can't. Yeah, you sight fishing. I mean, it's it's really fun, but some of the rivers here they're so tanny that you're not you're not really fishing them, but or you're not really sight fishing them, but. Um, the fish that tend to grab those are the fish that have been in the river for a long time. Those fish that are um, kind of getting territorial or something. Yeah, and we'll call them troutly. You know, they're <laughs> in the troutly areas, so they'll be kind of um, holding up like behind, um, you know, where you might find a rainbow trout as opposed to in the tail out of a river where a migrating fish might sit. You'll find these fish um, kind of in like pockets, and that's why I was kind of touching on pocket water. Um, and the migrating fish will push in there, but they'll kind of hit there, rest for a minute, and then sit. But you'll find a lot of those fish that were that you know that are caught swinging up here. They're like they're darker. They're kind of blushed up. They're kind of especially in the fall, they've been in a little bit longer than the rest than uh, those really chrome ones. Um, but I'm sure that skating near the salt could work. Um, I haven't tried that. Usually, if the tide's coming in and there's a big push of fish in, we're just trying to throw whatever we can, whatever fly we have on to get out there. And those fish are usually pretty crappy, but um, it is fun to see those, um, see the seals chasing those fish up into the rivers down here. That's really cool. So with the, again, with the uh, skating, do you uh, cast, step, and swing, or do you step, or so cast, I'll, swing, and step? So for that, um, I'm not too worried about the fly sinking at all. So that's, um, so I'll just do the standard cast swing step or cast step, cast swing step. Yep. So, yeah. So cast and then swing your fly and then step just to kind of work those areas. But it's very, it has to be the right situation. And, and uh, you're kind of doing a lot of walking to find like a good spot to, to skate a fly um, for me. And, uh, but I don't, you know, I don't do it too often, you know, a couple of times a year. I'll go down and start skating flies. And it's certainly not as eventful as skating mice up here for rainbows. Um, that seems that seems a very effective way to catch the rainbows up here, but um, skating a steelhead fly is uh, 
it's not not super effective the water like you were saying um alex that water's so cold you know those fish aren't too you know too interested i don't think in taking things off the surface but they'll do it and yeah you got to work for it though yeah it sounds almost like a zen art yeah. kind of get fish for trip <laughs> I think you kind of, it's a mindset thing you know like i don't you know care if i catch a fish i'm just gonna enjoy being out here and i think i think that's a good way to take all fishing but Okay. Well, we might end the Zoom here and um, appreciate everybody that tuned in and thanks Oliver for talking about yeah. this. Well, I picked up some good stuff. I'm going to try to get off the beads a little more and maybe do some more swinging of flies because I just get stuck using the beads most of the time. So. Cool. All right, everybody. Well, uh, thanks for tuning in if you did and um, hope to see you at the Fly Fishing Film Fest next month or at our Chino Hot Springs um, litter pickup. If not, have a great summer and we'll see you guys later. Sounds good.